Wednesday evening. We started um, three weeks ago, I think, or we had a break last week. Um, and each time, just having a different aspect, looking at a different aspect of prayer. It's not a course. It's not someone standing here and saying, this is how you do it. This is the recipe, and once you've got it, you sort it. Uh, all of us know here that have lived a lifetime of prayer, we know that it doesn't work that way, and Jesus proved it to us as well, because his way of praying and dealing with people was different every time. Um, so the first session we had... Um, um, Craig Duvall here with a team from Pinelands Baptist um, um, share with us their journey and some of the things that they've learned, um, especially around the fear of the Lord and the, having that balance between knowing that God is holy and very, very personal at the same time. And then um, last week, John um, shared with us just you know, coming into his presence and, and, and how we grow in prayer. And people share different ways in which we um, connect with God. Um, and so, and tonight, um, Ali is going to take us through some uh, principles. And those of you that received an email just saw that it's around intercession. And hopefully you saw that we were speaking about, and now I've lost it. Um, please bear with me. Uh, yes, does anyone remember? John 13, 34? Those of you that know your Bible. <laughs> so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The words that you got was probably NIV. I'm reading from the NLT. But it's the same thing as as we pray for each other and we actually do that in love, something happens. And so we're going to explore that tonight. And Ali is going to take us through. But I'd love to open up in, in prayer first. Jesus, we invite you into this space. We thank you that um, there is just so much to learn about talking with you, listening for your voice, and just following wherever you go, and being obedient in that, and seeing how your kingdom ripples throughout our world. And so tonight again, we want to learn more about you. So I pray that you will open our hearts to receive I pray that you will open our ears, just take any wax out that is, that is blocking our ears, to hear your voice and um, open our eyes to see you working amongst us tonight. I pray for this fellowship. I ask that you will, um, yeah, just let your love shine in the midst here. I pray for Ali. Uh, tonight that you will just use her powerfully. Pray for John as he also is involved in his bit. Just thank you, Father, that that praying with you and uh, is just an ongoing thing. So we welcome you here and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Over to you, Ali. I just want, before you start, I just want to point out where we're going next week. We're not going to meet. Next week on Tuesday, it's time to pray in the church. And we will, Emma's not here. Emma will be, be the focus of the evening in terms of, of support outreach partner. And we'll talk to her about how she gives some input about how to pray for missionaries. So that'll be, to a, in a sense, a, a sort of follow-on from this week. So we won't meet next, next Wednesday. The following Wednesday, we have Sheldon Tidwell coming from the Bay at Musenberg. And um, talking about how their church has been revitalized and changed by prayer and what they've learned. And then 4th of September, Pete Portal talking about prayer and social justice and how he's working in Mannenberg and what's happening in Mannenberg. But also a, a lot of um, experience in, in intercessory prayer. How many of you didn't go to the Fergus camp? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you missed some weather. I'm sure you've heard that, that we'd all rather have missed. Um, but it was a wonderful experience. And I just want to share from my, uh, my experience of it because, um, uh, you know, we've done prayer ministry at Christchurch for 100 years, you know, Jackie and everybody. And I think we, I, I initially used the R word, we got into a bit of a funk, you know, the, a funkish situation, especially at the 11 o'clock, the prayer team's diminished. And what I realized in contacting a lot of you who did prayer ministry on the weekend, I don't know quite how it happened, but we got into a sort of space where people thought, if I don't know Leviticus 41.3, and I can't quote um, Deuteronomy 6. And uh, I can't hear God and have an amazing prophetic word for someone. It somehow disables me from praying. So many people out there and said, well, I'm not good enough, or I'm not skilled enough, or I'm not clever enough. And actually, it was like a window open. I was actually horrified. I thought, is that what people in our church think? And in fact, I'd love you to just join me in a prayer because if that is so for, for anyone or people who are not in this room, it's just so horrible and so disabling. Uh, yeah, I so said, just join me in a little prayer. Lord, if that's what's happened, albeit inadvertently at our church, Lord, that just is so awful. And well, I want to apologize and those of us who've been involved for years Lord, if we've somehow conveyed that you have to have a PhD in prayer to pray for others, Lord, we, we really apologize to you and we ask for your forgiveness. And where there's strongholds and things and mindsets that aren't helpful around prayer, Lord, we ask you to dismantle them and remove them and give us a new freedom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's done and dusted. Well, I am delighted to introduce to you some people that you may not know, some people who have been around many, many blocks and have been absolute stars. And I've actually forgotten exactly who, I know who I asked, but I can't always remember. I'm going to start with Arlene. Yeah. And the good news is that you can sit where you are. You don't have to move. Um, I forgot to say that you get an extra 10 points in heaven because you came out on such a cold night. <laughs> Alan retired from the. <laughs> He's got three. So we just posed certain questions. I think you're all going to be answering a question. Um, Arlene, why do you like prayer ministry, and, and w w what, what does it for you when you pray for others? I think um, I got into the prayer ministry um, because I felt I had to be obedient. God, or the, I, was, I felt prompted. I would never pray out loud, never. It petrified me. And I, was, I, I remember I was in the kitchen one day, and... I can't remember the exact wording or whatever, but I felt that God was going to call me into the prayer ministry. I didn't know how, I didn't yeah. know when. And three yeah. weeks later, the bishop's wife came to me and said, would I get involved in the prayer ministry? And I yeah. felt I had to say yes because yeah. I'd been told to come. Oh, sorry, Arlene. Uh, uh, Di, I think she can't hear you. Do we need to put up the... Okay. Can you hear me better now? <laughs> Can you hear her now? Okay. Yeah. Do you want to... Re me to repeat some of that stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, closer. Okay. I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to be obedient when the call came for me to be involved in prayer. I didn't ever pray aloud because it just petrified me. Like Alison says, I felt maybe I wasn't good enough. I didn't have the right words or whatever. And we had a prayer ministry group that met before the services um, at different times, and we would get words of knowledge, which we'd, 
we would record and then speak it out in church if there was any, and then we would pray for people. Um, so I've been involved in, since then, that was Petersburg, so St. Luke's oh and okay. St. Martin's. <laughs> um, I've been involved in yeah. the prayer ministry there. Yeah. But I, I've been hesitant since we've been retired to just get involved because being a clergy, the wife of a clergy is, is a very difficult role in a sense. Um, so I stepped back from being involved in, in, in anything in the church and Alan said to me on the weekend, I kind of wanted to join Ali when she asked for people to pray but Alan said, no, we are going to pray on the focus weekend. And so I was just kind of roped in. <laughs> so I did. And that's why Ali called me <laughs> because she saw me involved there. I believe also when I do pray, I rely heavily on the Holy Spirit to um, not give me words of knowledge as such, such but to pray um, wisely for ever standing in front yeah, of me. Yeah. I, I pray beforehand that, you know, whatever God ordains for me at that time, that he will supply yeah, what I need yeah. to pray for somebody. Um, I don't know that I can say I love it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I do it. I do it. I'm kind of just, I feel yeah. I have to be obedient if Somebody says, pray for me, then and I do Arlene, that. And Arlene, you obviously prayed for your husband a bit, but I saw you praying with other people. Uh, was that helpful? Um, yes, it was fine. Um, I'm not scared to do it. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I just, yeah. whatever, God needs to bless whatever happens there. And yeah. it must be, it must be, um, what is the word? The person who I'm praying for must receive whatever God, mm, um, yeah. I, don't, I don't counsel during prayer, I just pray because I, I get prompted to ask things and, uh, you know, and then I pray, yeah. but I, I don't necessarily ask when I'm praying afterwards if I feel that something needs to be said or yeah. asked, I will get the person when the evening ends, I will go and say, oh, interesting. you know, um, okay. tell me this or tell yeah. me that. And, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, we loved having you on Focus. And, you know, you never want to say, John Ackerson, who was a minister here, used to say he, he would go to a dinner party and he'd hold out for as long as possible before, because if inevitably someone would say, what do you do? <laughs> and then he said it was a conversation killer. So that's why I didn't <laughs> say that Arlene had a, pers a member of her family in the clergy. Um, Anne, uh, did I ask you about this? Why do you enjoy praying for others? No, yes, come in the front here. This is our, our, our self-proclaimed rusty prayer minister. <laughs> For those of you who don't know Anne, uh, Anne's married to Raymond, and she works at Rustenburg in the finance department, and um, she's got it's twins of 40, kill joy of 50. Job. No, the, no. <laughs> Asking parents for money, yeah. That's do, you it, want, yeah. Uh, do you want to hold this one? Yeah, that's fine. Right. Right. What do you prefer, John? Yeah. 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 Zero, basically. Um, I'm one of those people that um, would sit at the back and um, just feel that I'm not equipped to pray for anybody. Um, a very long time ago, um, and some of you that have been in this room or have been at CCK for a long time uh, might uh, remember this. Um, when uh, Richard Fothergill was here, I think he came to do a he was the curate or something here back in the late 90s. Yeah, late 90s. <laughs> and I had this disastrous, I was very young then, and I, I had this disastrous, um, I was asked to read, and I, I just felt that I'd bumbled over this, these words in the Bible, and I just wanted to get off that stage as quickly as I could. And... Um, I was so embarrassed that I actually fled the church, essentially. <laughs> and little known to me, he actually had a word of knowledge for me, you know. Um, and about, oh, it was about a week or maybe a week or so later, um, 
uh, he, he came to me and said to me, <laughs> um, I just want to, uh, to tell you that um, I just had this, this, this prophecy over you. And I was a bit old, you know. Um, and he said that you're going to be involved in healing ministry. And I promptly have shut that completely down um, and um, just, you know, when Richard was here a couple of months, was it a couple of months ago or over a year ago, I think, I just thought, I'm just not ready. I just, in my space of life, um, where I was at, I just thought, no. And, you know, he spoke about people coming to him and saying, you know, um, this hasn't come to fruition, you know, you prayed words over me and, and this hasn't come to fruition. And uh, so I thought, well, I'm not going to be that person. I'm actually just not going to even, I'm not going to hold that to you anyway. Um, and the last couple of months, um, I've just had little, very, it's, it's been very subtle stirrings that have been going on and um, my children are getting older and um, just, yeah, just thinking, you know, maybe it's time for me to start getting involved in avenues of, of church life again, you know, um, and not being particularly sort of thinking about what avenues there are. And um, anyway, after a long journey, we, we, we were sort of going, getting to focus in a few days before, a, sorry, a couple of weeks ago, that lovely couple that lost their, their baby, um, I was sitting behind them, and this is what's prompted all of this. Um, and um, when they walked, we were there sitting in front, and they came in a bit later, and they came and sat down in front of us. And I just got this, I was overwhelmed with, with uh, um, I lost my first child um, uh, 17 years ago, and as a baby, uh, she was still born, and it was a devastating time in my life. It, I felt like my life, everything had been shattered into a million pieces, and those feelings came up again, and I was thinking, whoo, where's this come from? And uh, the whole time of, of them sitting in front of me, um, I just got a sense um, that, um, God loves them. Just the whole service, you know, and I just didn't know how or why I was tapping into those feelings of what I had felt back then. And I, and I could see on her face, just I could see that something, something terrible had happened. And um, her whole face just would say a thing. And then Guy mentioned, and I thought, oh, okay, now, now I get it. Um, and I just felt, uh, uh, then Guy and Ali came to them after the service, and I just felt prompted to actually stay and, and pray with them, and, and I did. And, um, and then Alison messaged me <laughs> a couple of weeks later and said to me, yeah, it just gave me feedback from that, and just said to me, don't you want to come and pray at Focus? At which I just thought, well, you know, maybe I must just answer the call, be in obedience. I'm not a particularly, I would just, yeah, I just thought, let me just see where this goes. And um, those of you that were there, I think Alison couldn't believe her eyes and her ears when I <laughs> stepped up with, um, again, I was just standing there just sort of, thinking, oh my goodness, you know, standing up there, and I just had this very incredibly strong picture, and this, it's a real urge to, to you know, to, that I was quite overwhelmed by, to go up and actually say what I'd seen, which then the picture echoed somebody else, what the picture that they had had, um, and then um, promptly started praying for a few people, and... <laughs> feedback that I got from them was, how did you know what to pray for me? <laughs> how did you know what to pray for me? And to be honest, I had no idea. I felt like I was bumbling my way through the entire time I was praying for somebody, just going, I don't know 
who you are. I've never met you, but this is what I just feel called to be praying for. And so, um, so I am basically that person that you have just been talking about. I have no, I don't, I can't recite verses from the Bible. I'm, I'm going through the menopause and my brain is a fog. I can't remember what I did five minutes ago. So at this point, so I can't remember things. <laughs> I can't remember what's going on, but I just felt um, just very much aware. I, I, I guess I, I've, I, the word that comes to mind is, um, standing in the authority of God, um, and definitely over the weekend, I felt a huge Holy Spirit presence in that. And actually, um, I mentioned it to you, um, Ali, that I actually felt that even more people should have come up and prayed. I actually was ready to pray for people. I was just so ready to pray. And when people said to me, what can I pray for you? I, for the first time, I must say, in about 15 years, I actually said, it's not about me. It's actually what I can do for other people. Because um, I was partnered with somebody and she made a very, I was just saying, oh, I'm a rusty prayer person. And she said, it's not about us. She just said, we're the vessels. And that was just so apt, actually. Um, because it's actually realizing that we may know, know, we don't know what is going on, but I think it's it's such a, blessing to have that word from God specifically into your situation and regardless of what we might be praying we don't know I think the repercussions are so so lasting um, and I think that's actually what gave me quite a lot of joy I was so surprised <laughs> I go oh this is a new feeling <laughs> that, I've been, that I've been feeling <laughs> Um, you know, I've just been living in self-pity for the last few years, so it was it was a it was a wonderful upliftment of that, and I think that it was a paradigm shift for me um, because I'd also listened to um, Abel Cheers talk um, in one of the seminars, which again was just mind blowing, and I think combined with that, just realizing that yeah. Um, actually maybe prayer ministry is where I need to be going because I really felt so blessed by it actually I was just so I was so surprised <laughs> bewildered is my word that I think I've, I've, I've said many times you know um, but uh, it was um, but I just um, I, I think in the last uh, uh, my vision is it's just so bizarre what I've had in my mind I actually just had this whole thing about um, uh, that uh, about having a whole healing ministry here you know at CCK not necessarily in a church setting but once a month that or even starting off with once a month or twice a month just having a an evening where we just dedicate to to praying for people and and healing ministry um you know uh, as a as a mom at the services i'm always i, I know that's so pressured in the service especially at the 11 o'clock where and maybe that's what's been holding me back. I've always had kids and I'm so aware of my teenagers and they're just so, when are we going home, mom? You know, why are you chatting? You know, it's, it's so it's this whole sense of always being pressured and, and not having time to, to pray for people or be prayed for for yourself. And, and one of the moms, I think um, I could see, she was a mom of, of younger children and she just felt so refreshed by being prayed for and, and being you know, receiving, and it was just so important. I mean, I know it's difficult for, for people to get out at night. I mean, that is it's always a challenge with a, a younger, you know, family church. But um, it, it's just something that I, I sort of was thinking about following on from the Focus Weekend was was something like that. that. And that's quite big, but that's just sort of in my head where I'm thinking. So that's it. Summary, summary where I'm at. <laughs> Anything is possible. And um, I think our Sue Coulson and a couple of others of you, why do you like being prayed for? Uh, have you benefited? Was that the question I asked you? And, I'm, and Natasha as well, thank you. Yeah, have you benefited from it? What do you feel like to benefit from doing it? Well, it's been wonderful. And I have to say in CCK, um, 
you feel so loved. <laughs> There's a great sense of love when you're being paid for and part of the community. I, uh, that's what I feel when I come. But um, prayer works, so it's lovely to be prayed for. Um, prayer works. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you know Natasha Haskins, um, who, well, you do so many things, Natasha. I mean, one of her, her skills is she's the most incredible baker and does lots of the cakes and things that we eat at Christchurch. And you've got three children, one at Stellenbosch and two younger children. Yeah. So for me, um, my kids kind of bullied me into starting to come to church. Um, and I had grown up in going to church and being prayerful and being in the word, but I had some very traumatic things happen in my marriage and things like that, which kind of, I chose to separate myself from God and from the church because of that. And coming, and I've always been a prayer, like I've always been that mom who's constantly praying for my kids, for my husband, um, and Coming back to the church, I was broken. I was just heavy and burdened beyond. <laughs> uh, yeah, so coming to a safe space where um, I could just, just surrender and be prayed for. And I've been coming to CCK now for, I think it's about two years. And the healing that has taken place in those two years and the progress that I've made from going, taking that step of going out and asking to be prayed for, and it's just been incredible. Yeah. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Natasha's really called to prayer. Um, uh, perhaps, Jean, would you like to share? Yeah, so the other side of the pendulum is, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but perhaps you felt a bit reticent about prayer. <laughs> or praying for others. Um, yes, so I'd never, um, this was my first experience of prayer ministry at Focus, and Alison asked me if I'd do that, and the only other experience I have is praying in our small groups, and um, so at least we practice there. I've got two small group members with me here, um, but yeah, I was feeling like, i um, not sure if this is for me. Um, but um, I'm trying more and more to hear God, and God speaks to me a little bit through insects. And the Wednesday lunchtime before focus, I was sitting outside having lunch, and suddenly there was this huge praying mantis on my arm, much bigger <laughs> praying mantis than normal. And it must have been on the chair and climbed on my arm, and I got quite a fright, and we eyeballed each other. But I decided that was a sign of encouragement from God. Um, and then, um, yeah, at Focus, my um, partner for the prayer ministry was Louise Blatch. Yeah. So, um, fortunately, she could pray a lot for the person who came. And I tried to gather a couple of thoughts and said my little bit at the end that I thought may be the right thing to pray. And... Um, the experience was very rewarding because Alison said we must have our eyes open. So I could see uh, the person really taking it in and, um, and then appreciating it so much afterwards. So um, it seems a rewarding thing to do. Um, and yeah, I was worried I don't have the verses or pictures or anything. And I didn't get any of that, but I accept I'm at the beginning and wanting to grow. Thanks so much, Louise. Um, Jean's a wonderful artist, for those who don't know. Um, uh, does anyone else uh, feel that they're, they're, they're a little bit fearful or they're anxious about praying for others? Is anyone in that sort of space? Um, 
have you ever tried to kind of face that fear? Or this is else, is it? Yeah, the, yeah. Um, uh, can you share about it, or would you rather not? With, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like the stage. Um, I've never enjoyed praying aloud, and I think I've started to get a little bit braver with just being in home group and being with people that I trust and love. Um, but in a bigger setting, um, like with people I don't know at all, I, I prefer to be quiet, um, and I feel intimidated exactly the way you, you said about scripture. I don't have scripture on the tip of my tongue. Um, and I often feel when I do pray then that I blabber on too much. Um, so then I'd rather be quiet. Um, yeah, that's my prayer. Um, well, in, in a way, if you pray, if you two people pray for one person, I'll let the other person do their thing because I know they always will pray better than me. Um, but if I'm the only one there, I have to step up. And then I have to, like, sort of trust that something is going to come out that makes sense. You must listen to this recording, else. We're going to challenge you in a few months. <laughs> Uh, how, how they uh, well Sandy too Sandy's one of these uh, extroverts <coughs> and um, you know do you limit praying for others to, to a church environment Sandy <laughs> Sorry, do, you do you limit praying for others to a church environment no <laughs> <laughs> I don't <laughs> I will I will listen for the Lord and when he shows me to pray for somebody then I try and get the guts together to do it. <laughs> because it's not always easy when you're in a completely strange environment. How is somebody going to receive it? Um, but usually I will spend some time with the Lord in the morning and I use the lectionary. So if I'm praying, preparing before midday, I will use the morning prayer readings. If it's after midday, I will use the afternoon prayer. And then usually the Lord will speak to me in that, and I'll sort of hold that with me for the rest of the time, so long as I can remember. And then when I see somebody, oh, it's, that's for that person. So that's what I do. Can you share an example where it's had um, good looking fruit or fruit? No, I can't think of that. <laughs> but, but I do love going into the hospital and praying with the folk. And I remember one occasion when I was in a shopping center and I met a woman that I knew just a little bit. And I said to her, how are you? Oh, she said, I've just had the most frightful business meeting with a friend, with a colleague. Absolutely dreadful. And she felt betrayed and it was dishonest and the whole da-da-da-da. And so from our Sozo training, I knew about ungodly soul ties. So I said to her straight away, well, let's how, uh, uh, let's ask Jesus, we can pray to break the ungodly soul ties with this person. And it's about, and Jesus said, yes, it's about four sentences. She said, I can't believe the difference. I can't believe. I'm just feeling absolutely different. So it's so amazing when you, when God speaks to you zip about something and you can be <coughs> alongside a person with that. And do we always get it right? No. And the person who's receiving your prayer is there to test what you're saying anyway. So, so you don't have to get it right. But when you do get it right, it's great. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. Um, Ed, I'm pouncing on you a little bit. Um, uh, is that okay? Um, so Ed uh, is married to Jessica and have, in retirement, come back to Christchurch after being in the City Highlands and Lady Brand and all over. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, Ali in a message to me uh, said, well, maybe you could share something about how, how the Holy Spirit 
helps you in prayer. That was, I think, some of the words. Um, but I, I just want to start off by saying that, you know, for me, uh, who's sort of been walking with Jesus for many years, uh, ups and downs and uh, nearer and further and so on, um, you know, it, it's, the, it's the Holy Spirit that makes Jesus real to you. <laughs> And you know because you know <laughs> his presence. Uh, and, and no matter what's going on around you, uh, uh, no matter how you're feeling, uh, you know that Jesus is there and you can reflect and, and, and bring him into life. So that, that, that was the first thing. And, and, and so for me, in terms of praying, um, praying individually in, 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 in uh, it, it, it's it, uh, through the Spirit. I've had this direct. Was Jesus is there? I could speak to him. But then also within small group situations, I found that easier. Corporately, I found that easier. Yeah. But but when it came around to this thing of uh, prayer ministry within a church context, or even even within the focus context, there it sort of like raises the bar a bit. You know? uh, because, because uh, God is calling you to, in, in a way, be, uh, be uh, discerning on behalf of that person that's being prayed for. Because they've come forward because God has been speaking to them. And yeah, you are standing next to them. <laughs> and what do you do? Well, you know, uh, at, at, at a few... Uh, Weeks ago, there was uh, was it Mike Day? He sp he preached on various things, and, and and what struck me was that the things that we're called to be is a holy presence, and so that was the one thing that I thought if we, in the prayer ministry sense that you come alongside someone, and in a way you're standing in the gap, because that person is coming before God. God has challenged them, and maybe they're, 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 and, and and in the sense that they can't express further, you standing in the gap with them. So, so what to do? I was very fortunate that uh, <clears throat> I was partnered with John <laughs> for for this, some of the time, um, and and I, and I found that helpful because John was able to share pictures, and I was able to pray, and 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 I and, and I felt felt that sort of uh, sort of a growth point for myself. Um, yeah. Also, uh, John did share with me that or us that. That there was a word about praying for the leaders, you know, the church leaders, and Brendan Fox was there, and Jeremy Jogging yeah. did. And you were the one, all these people went, pray, 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 pray. And Ed was the one who said, why don't we stop and just listen to God for a minute? So there we go. Yeah. So it wasn't a one way street. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and yeah, and, and yeah. In, in that particular yeah. instance, so you, 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 have, you have a situation where you have two people who are leaders in the church yeah. and, and, and are saying, well, we just need refreshing we need to be mm -hmm. renewed lifted yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and that's different from another person who came along and said you know i've been going along in work and things in life and i've plateaued out and i i, I know god but I, I i feel as though i, I need to go further you know mm -hmm. so they yeah. totally different situations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and and we that's where the discernment comes yeah. in yeah as to yeah and you have to yeah. listen to god yeah. at that point yeah yeah and, and really, what to say, I, I mean, you're really in God's hands at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, Thanks that, so much. That's Ed. really all for me. Um, and now, Sarah, do you want to do something easier to get into us? Um, the thing I remember about Sarah is that she nearly, she's very fit. She cycles and runs and puts people like me to shame. But she got COVID so badly, she nearly died. In hospital, you know, how long were you in Vincent Pilotti in COVID? Uh, I think four, five, five, six, four, five, six weeks. Yeah. Um, Sarah just came with an inch of losing her life, and it was <laughs> oh, very, very difficult time. Yeah. How do you find the Holy Spirit prompts you, Sarah? Gosh, yeah. so, um, yeah, I mean, that experience was profound, and mm. really life, yeah, I really did feel completely delivered mm. and I had prayer around me I didn't even mm. know about it so yeah. obviously the church and um, and friends small group but I only found out afterwards that there were people in the 
hosp- coming to the yeah. hospital, to, uh, nurses I didn't even know just around me. So sure. that was really just incredible. Um, but I've never felt confident to pray for anybody. Mm-hmm. So I must mm-hmm. be honest, Ellie, when you sent me the <laughs> message, I was like, I'm sure she got the right person here. You know, <laughs> did you mean this, Sarah? Um, and I've never done anything to demonstrate to you that I can pray with others. So I'm not sure why you asked me, but it did, it was an incredible experience, and I nearly said no to you, because yeah. I thought, no, no, I can't yeah, possibly, yeah. I don't, I'm not equipped, and I don't have the words, and yeah, I yeah. feel totally, and I, I also want, was being, uh, feeling quite selfish, you know, I have a very busy job, and mm. every, like lots of people, so busy, and I just wanted to totally yeah. folk immerse yeah. myself but yeah. I didn't want to be responsible yeah. for anyone else but it was such a gift that you yeah. gave me because yeah. by stepping into that space of praying with others um, it was compl- it was just wonderful and I mm. ho- most of the time the person would come and I was praying with Emma who's just amazing <laughs> and um, and the person would come and they say, please, can you pray for this? And I was like, yes, yes, I feel the same way. I, I need the same. <laughs> and, um, and it made me think, you know, I've never gone up for prayer yeah, on a Sunday. Yeah, I've always yeah. felt, no, no, I don't have, th- things can't, are not that bad. I've, I've felt so intimidated to go up. Mm-hmm. And it, it made my whole weekend so much richer yeah. and just connected with the people I prayed with. I feel a, a yeah, deep connection yeah, and then yeah. I would find myself keep praying for them so it was thank you for yeah. the gift of asking me because oh, wow. I didn't uh, expect it yeah. to be such a rich experience Gosh, oh, that's wonderful Sarah um, does anyone else want to share anything if you haven't if you'd like to share something okay Thank you, Lord. Okay. Okay, so shall I say it again? Does anyone want to share something about why they enjoyed being prayed for? Hello, Dai. Yeah, yeah. I think I need to say that I don't necessarily hear God very clearly when I pray, particularly when I start to pray. And I think, what are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying? You know, and... Um, and so I find it incredibly helpful to pray with at least one other person or two or three people. Um, and then you just relax. And then you just, you just pray for the most obvious thing, the person, or you just keep quiet. And then as you, as you start to share what the Lord is saying, it flows. So, you know, don't go, kind of go up there and say, <gasps> you know, give me something, give me something, give me something. Just pray the obvious thing. And for me... Um, the thing that that is most helpful is just more Lord, more Lord, just more Lord. And you just watch the person and you just see them just receiving from the Lord. I mean, it's amazing. And, you know, other people hear and see and speak and then it begins to flow and that raises my faith. And I just love praying with other people for somebody else. So, yeah, go for it. And I'm blown away by by all of you who've taken steps, yeah. <coughs> yeah, yes, yes. I did have an observation on the weekend, which was we often say come forward for prayer, mm-hmm. but it's such a huge mm-hmm. step. And I wonder whether we can say go sideways, go backwards. There's people dotted all over because it is so, mm-hmm. it's so hard to be, to be watched mm-hmm. to go. And, there, you know, there were people I was watching and you could see that they were like, but they just too, just too, too much it's too much. much. Yeah. And yeah. so it's like hard, because once you've yeah. done it once, yeah. it's like, it's like you, you get a taste of it. It's so wonderful that yeah. I just, I just wanted to, it was just an yeah. observation. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, funny now you mentioned that. Um, actually, MJ said for those, I'm sorry, if Avril and other people who don't come to our church, um, but MJ said, can you get at least 10 prayer ministers for 11 o'clock on Sunday? 
I said, okay, so please speak to me afterwards if, you, if you've never done it before and you go to be there, or, or, or you'd like to just do it again because you've done it a million times. Uh, but you do have to come at about half past ten because we want to really pray, you know, because if we don't pray, God, well, of course he does move, but it's much easier if we pray beforehand. Um, hi, see you. Yeah. I found that um, sometimes I look around the church and I just see somebody and I get the sense that they need prayer. And so instead of, um, I just go and sit next to them. And I, well, or as I pass them, I kind of say, hey, would you like some prayer? Are you okay? You know, and often they say, yes, I would. And I sit next to them and pray. So, because I can see they're not going to go up but um, I only do it if I'm prompted. Yeah. Yeah. I know, John, you like doing that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you handing over to me? Yeah. Okay, I'll put this down. Um, some of us say, the Spirit of His Prayer is going to leave prayer with you for 100 years, and I'm not a very good organiser, and I hate it. And, you know, MJ said, they've got so many people at Focus in the UK, per capita, praying minister. And, I mean, I was actually very in an, an anarchic mood, actually, quite frankly, before Focus. And it's been such a joy. And I think, t I said to MJ, she had two credit, because she was at this massive Focus in the UK with 12,000 people and 500 prayer ministers. And she has said that this guy from some church, I can't remember, he, he said, you absolutely have to pray in that context in twos. And you have to wear a label and you have to come forward. I mean, I hear what you say. And a few other little pointers, keep your eyes open, which of course we all knew. But I found that very liberating. And I, for me, prayer ministry or watching it happen often can make me feel very anxious. I feel, where are the prayer ministers? No one's coming up for prayer. They can't respond. <gasps> and I was liberated from that. I don't care now. <laughs> and I just think you're all so wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We pray. Father, help me with what I have to say. I don't keep you poor people all night. And show me what is highlight to highlight. Amen. So I've got four pieces of paper. MJ was going to give input. And I don't, MJ was going to give input now, but she double booked herself so she can't come. And I don't want to go through the practicalities. You've heard some of them come up, but there's so much that has come up through all the, what people have said. And we need to string it together in a, in a sort of handout or whatever at some stage and with more, more meetings like this. I don't want to call them training, but more gatherings to share how we can do this. But what I thought I wanted to say, I mean, one of the ideas was I was going to give some biblical input, or biblical, not input, biblical foundation. But I'm not going to give all of that. There's a lot of it. Um, things like, you know, uh, Paul says Galatians 6, I think it is, um, carry each other's burdens, because in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. And Jesus himself, John 17, he prays for us. Um, and he told Simon Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you, but I've been praying for you. And there are quite a few examples like that in Jesus' life. There are many examples in Paul's life. And Paul again and again says, please pray for me, pray for us, and so on. So I'm not going to give you all of those, but just to highlight that one that Elka started with, again, a new commandment I give to you. This is Jesus in the upper room the night before he dies, after washing their feet. The new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. If you pray for someone they almost 99.9% .9 of them appreciate it. They feel loved. And I've had people where nothing at all ever happened, and they said, oh, you're the one who prayed for me. I, I, I used to work in a hosp hospital, and I used to pray occasionally with patients and parents, and they'd come to follow up months or years later and outpatients say, oh, you're the doctor who prayed for us. Nothing particularly came of the prayer in, t in terms of healing or anything, but I, they remember being loved. So I wanted to say something about shame because I, I was <coughs> listening to something uh, a, a week or two ago and this person said the prime the most the biggest obstacle to effective prayer life for individuals and bodies is shame and 
he went further to elaborate on that, but he got to the end point by saying, the biggest shame, the mo not rather, the most powerful shame is shame of sexual sin. Just by the way, uh, pornography, sexual sin and so on. But, but it's a scale, but any shame, sometimes simply shame of having failed, shame of having not, not done the reading correctly, Ruth Ann. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing can just cripple you. And I used to be like it when I was young. I would... I knew there was a standard and I couldn't meet the standard, therefore I'm not even going to try. And the, the point about shame is it's, it's, it's a reflection of the culture we live in, where s you, you are defined by your success. You, your success is, is the measure of your worth. And in the, in the kingdom, it's not that at all. In the kingdom, it's like when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were naked and unashamed. They were unashamed because they, there was nothing between them and God. And... Then they fell, and they, Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid myself. And that's what we do with shame. We hide ourselves. And the gospel has come to set us free from that. And so we need to avoid this idea of shame. Of, and, and shame is not necessarily um, shame of sin. It's shame of not, f not doing well enough. Who am I to intercede with God Almighty for this person? And this person is so important. You know, if one of the leaders in the church comes up to me for prayer, who am I? to pray for you, you know, and that, that's nonsense. Every single one of us can pray for every single one of us, and every single one of us should be seeking to be prayed for. And uh, one of the things that really got prayer ministry taking off in Christchurch 20 years ago was when Duncan and John Atkinson themselves came forward for prayer. They said, we're going to prayer ministry now, anybody wants to come, and then they'd walk around and stand there in the queue. And the fact that anybody can pray for anybody is what we need to drill into ourselves. So no shame can separate us from the love of God, Romans 8, 29. Nothing can separate from the, us from the love of God. In the beginning of that chapter, he says, there is no condemnation. It's not about performance. And remember, Psalm 1, 27, the Lord builds the house. And if he's not building a house, you labor in vain. The same as uh, John 15. Um, if, you, if you abide in the vine, you'll bear fruit. Nobody can do anything without me. And so we're not doing it. It's the Holy Spirit. Somebody, I think, again, Anna, somebody said it's the Holy Spirit's work. It's not us who do it. And so we're a community of people who have the right to approach the throne of God in confidence, no matter what you've been up to during the week. You, there's no condemnation. You, you, we are a community of people who can approach the throne of God with confidence. That's what Hebrews 4 says. There's a, approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us. Grace is the power of God to help us. And then Hebrews 10, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, never mind who we are, what we've achieved, what we haven't achieved, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by a new and living way opened to us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God who lives always to intercede for us, this is in chapter 12, um, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Full assurance because our hearts are sprinkled to cleanse, cleanse us from the guilty conscience, our guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. So let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. And that's the point about prayer ministry. We profess a hope in the fact that Jesus is interceding and the Holy Spirit is doing this and we're just a tool. We're just ministering. And I like the, the, the um, illustration somebody gave of, we are like Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is John. I'm a sinner, but I'm, but I'm here. And I'm, I've been clean, clean, uncondemned for X number of years, and I'm working for Jesus. You know, that, that's our identity. Our identity is a sinner redeemed by Christ. It's not a person who's achieved great things, and not a person who, through whom healing's been done, not a person who preaches great things, <coughs> not a person who does or doesn't do anything. It's just a person redeemed by Christ. So that is about shame. Yes, I'm, I'm just hesitant about time. Um, what do you think, Alison? Because we need to go into groups. Can you say it in four sentences? Can I say it in shame? Yeah. Shame is a four sentence? Yes. Okay, go. Shame is the biggest shame. But, but come here. Come to the microphone. <coughs> so first of all, you ask Jesus, is there any shame that you want me to give to you? And never say to, never say to anybody, are you carrying shame? No, Jesus, is there any shame you want me to give to you? If he says yes, 
You ask Jesus to help you take the shame out of you and put it in your hands. When it's all in your hands, you lift your hands up and you say, Jesus, I offer you this shame. Will you take it from me now? And he does. <coughs> and then you say, and ask Jesus what he's giving you in exchange. And then the focus is on what he's giving you rather than what you are carrying. Okay? Okay. Close your eyes. Let's do that. What is the shame you're carrying? And even if it's a small thing, or it's a big thing, ask God to show you what it is. What it is that might obstruct you, even if it's just to trip you up a bit in ministering for him. And then in your mind, give it to him. He's here, he's standing here. His hands are open, waiting for it. Give it to him. And now say in your mind, in your heart to him, okay, what are you giving me in return? What is the opposite of this? What is the compensation you're giving me for, for giving that up? What have you got to give me in a gift? Lord Jesus, we ask for your blood to be poured over these things, the blood of life, new life, these gifts that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't have anything, that you've heard anything or anything, it doesn't matter. Keep praying that process. Keep waiting for that answer, ask God, asking God what he's going to give you. Um, okay, we want to go into groups, so I just want to make a last comment. John Wimber, many of you know who John Wimber was, founded the Vineyard Church, amazing movement of evangelism, worship and ministry and prayer ministry. I learned prayer ministry through, through what he taught and so on. And well, we did, in fact, Christchurch did. But um, in the mid-90s, towards the end of his life, he traveled to, to many of the bigger vineyard churches around the world. He came here as well, 97 or so. And he said a couple of months before he died, his sadness is that we've been making them into an audience. They're supposed to be an army. And he was seeing these big churches, especially after the Toronto Blessing, people coming to experience the Spirit and enjoy the worship and wonderful preaching and going home again. He said, we're making them into an audience. They're supposed to be an army. And that sort of has always struck a bell with me, that we're supposed to be an army. Sundays is, is to gather and to see each other and have fellowship and so on. Yes, but that's not the point. The point is to come and do something for one another and through the week do something for one another. And that's how we know they'll, they will know we are, are his disciples, if we love each other by showing it. So the practicalities of how to do this and how to listen to God and how to grow in hearing, hearing the Spirit, how to rely on the Spirit, how to trust the Spirit and so on, are going to come through these kind of testimonies and we're going to do them again at some stage. But now we want to break into groups.